reading Chapter 5 A Prayer of Prey, Courtesy of the United States Government, written by myself, Robin Ariel Ross, St. Clair Holy. This is coincident? I do not think so. All the above photographs will be explained or enlightened upon as I reach the correct chronological time period in my life. For now, I am going to continue my story from the age of 16 when I made my first trip to California in the year that my mom supposedly died, which is 1979. Notice that the year that I'm old enough to venture forth on my own with an older friend, my biological mother dies in a freak accident. Or was it? Or suicide. Neither scenario very believable. However, could it be coincidental? I do not think so. Coincidence once or twice in a lifetime? Maybe. From here on out, the coincidences pile up one after the other until there is no more room for the word coincidence. But rather, the word becomes more suitable or appropriate as cover-up, conspiracy, or both. Having just received my driver's license, signed for by my proud parents as I had just taken a school-sponsored driving course, and I had passed all the tests, I was wondering what to do with the long summer which lay ahead. A friend of the woman who would one day be the mother of my son Gary and my wife asked me to accompany him on a trip to California. He was in his 30s, a father of two, who intended to take his boys to Disneyland while on a business trip to Mexico to visit missionaries. He wanted to know if I would be interested in going with him for the purpose of an all-around helper. Duties would consist of babysitting, part-time driver, and conversationalist. All I needed to do was bring my spending money for myself. I readily spoke to my parents and agreed to his offer. The date we left was July 27, 1979. The trip would take approximately one month, and as we were going into Mexico to visit a church in Guadalajara, Mexico. This trip was to be the final chapter of my childhood, as I had not yet lost the innocence of childhood or the naivety, which is usually associated with young children. After returning from California with Gary at the end of August, I was very confused as I realized that my childhood memories were indeed correct. The United States was my country, my home, and that is where I belong. This realization, along with the normal pangs of growing pains associated with adolescence, resulted in my dropping out of school in the last year and moving out of my parents' home with no idea where I was going or why. I met a couple of guys who were roommates and they invited me to share rent with them. Around the same time, I met Brian and, well, we decided to go camping on Vancouver Island. This is notable because we ended up camping at Half Moon Bay, which is where my biological mother married another American, <coughs> my legal father. I cannot confirm whether or not he could be my biological father. Cleta June Cray and John Blythe Webster were married at Saturday Lake near Half Moon Bay in the District of Couch in the year 1951. Vital statistics officers in both countries have suggested that either he or my biological father was a Canadian citizen explaining how I was adopted in Canada. However, since my mom's legal husband signed the documentation for adoption, the citizenship of her common law husband or my biological family is immaterial. The fact that John Blythe Webster was an American with no legal Canadian status whatsoever that I could find would mean that the adoption itself was an illegal act, that the only people with the ability to circumvent the laws of both countries and deny an American citizen his rights with myself would have to be government related, as in the jurisdiction of the State Department or the military. John was returned to Blight, California upon his death, which in and of itself proves my assertion of his American citizenship. This due to a coronary heart attack where his American Social Security death benefits were also sent. This information was located on the Social Security Death Index. Another subject concerning the Social Security Death Index, which is considered public domain and is accessible to anyone, that is, it did not list my mom's death until as late as 1997. During three years of actual research trying to locate my biological roots, private investigators and government agencies could not access information on my mother or biological family until after I contacted the New Mexico State Police in 1997. I spoke with Agent Lawrence Murray, an agent attached to the State Police. 
I was informed by a source of which I feel is valid that this same agent mentioned above was profiled on TV as a government source specializing in state investigations regarding the material and evidence involving UFO sightings and abduction claims in the state of New Mexico. This investigator was assigned to and involved with my case for almost two years. Page 22. All U.S. citizens who die are issued a de death certificate and then listed on the Social Security Death Index in order to protect against the fraudulent use of Social Security numbers. Does that mean that there was no death certificate issued for my mom until I started looking for answers? A lot more. on this subject later. My second trip to California took place with my two roommates, Bob and Alan. I had purchased a 1975 Ford Special Edition pickup truck in a yellow, blue, and red. Perfect for California, I thought. We left Vancouver in November of 1979 and did not return until April of 1980. On that trip, Bob left us for a period of time to return to Canada. During that time frame, Alan and I met a gentleman who went by the name of Cliff who looked like Kenny Rogers and was well known and liked by the locals in the area of Cardiff, Carlsbad, and Oceanside, California. Cliff regaled us with stories of working for the CIA, the buying of an island belonging to the British Empire. The proof he offered us for these stories included a deed from the office of the Queen of England for a 99-year lease in exchange for the building of an airstrip on the island. This leads me to believe that, like most of my family, Cliff was also murdered, at least on paper, for the knowledge he had of me and his own investigative abilities. Cliff and I became very good friends, and I stayed with him for a period of time. Ellen found a job at Captain Kino's in Acadia. I would like to thank Terry, the owner, for all the help he's given to people over the years who were on the run or searching for themselves. This is out of the kindness of his own heart. Cliff was employed as an artist and a heavy equipment operator, and I was left, left with the impression that Cliff was hiding something, but I very much doubt that he had a criminal record of any kind. Cliff died of coronary before I had a chance to ask him for assistance in tracking down my family history or being able to show him my own hard-won American passport. Cliff had left for a week work-related trip and would not return for a couple of weeks. So I suggested to Ellen that we go to New Mexico. Could this be another coincidence? Before that, we had no intentions of him leaving California. On top of that, it was the middle of winter and it was snowing in the higher elevations. We used Highway 8 and headed east to Phoenix, Arizona. We spent a very cold night in our vehicle in the mountains with the snow falling around us. The next day when we dropped down to the desert floor of Arizona, the sunshine heated us up. We were so glad as our bodies soaked up the heat of the sun. This is Chapter 6, Arizona, Protection or Luck. While I was young enough to make plenty of mistakes in the future, this was probably the worst one yet to date and could have very easily ended up with us having no future, ever. As we drove towards Phoenix, Ellen noticed a hitchhiker on the side of the road. A closer look revealed that the man in his late 20s or early 30s was wearing a cast on his leg. We were not thinking about why a man with a broken leg was way out in the desert, nor the fact that we had seen no broken down vehicles. Feeling sorry for him persuaded us to pull over. Then the man pulled his cast off and Two other men ran towards the truck from where they had been hiding in the culvert. I had no time to pull out as they reached the truck, so we just allowed events to unfold as I relate them to you here. The man with the cast was the obvious leader. I could tell as they loaded their packs, beer, and cigarettes into my pickup. We continued on our way to Phoenix. Somehow the leader had managed to trade places with Ellen. This placed the leader of this little band and I in the cab, and Ellen and two others in the box effectively separating us as per the old adage, divide and conquer. It was perhaps at this point when the hitchhikers offered us a beer 